covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons, as I mentioned in my bonding video. But are the electrons shared equally between the two atoms? And by that I mean in these two orbitals that are in contact with each other, are the electrons spending their time equally divided between this atom and this atom? Or do they spend more time closer to one atom than the other? Well the answer is yes, they are pretty much equal in molecules where the atom of an element is bonded to the same element. So like in hydrogen or in chlorine, these are the same element, so the electrons are shared equally. Which I can show by drawing the electrons in the middle. But what if we have hydrogen chloride? Like that. Are the electrons in this bond in the middle? Well the answer is no, they actually lie more towards the chlorine. And why is that? That's because of a factor called electronegativity. Electronegativity. What is electronegativity? Well, it is defined as the ability of an atom to draw towards it the bonding pair of electrons. So, in this example, it is the ability of chlorine to draw towards it the electrons in the covalent bond. But why is that? Well, electronegativity is affected by two main factors. The first one is atomic number. So the amount of protons in its nucleus. And we can illustrate that by thinking about what's actually happening. If we have positive protons and negative electrons in the bond, these electrons are going to be drawn towards the positive charge of the nucleus. And logically, if we have more protons, we have a greater charge and the electrons are going to be more strongly drawn towards the nucleus. Another factor that affects electronegativity is the distance of valence orbitals from the nucleus. From the nuclei. So the distance of the valence orbitals from the nucleus basically means where or how far away is the outermost energy level from the nucleus. So we have our nucleus here. We have these energy levels represented by these circles. And in this example, the bonding pair of electrons is going to be on the, sorry, scribbled on the page, is going to be on the third energy level. So we're going to have a sharing of electrons on the third energy level. And this third energy level means that the previous two energy levels, also occupied by electrons, are going to shield the outermost electrons from the positive charge of the nucleus. So this positive charge of the nucleus has to go through two layers of these of these negatively charged electrons in order to even reach this outermost level. So the further away the bonding pair is away from the nucleus, the more shielded it's going to be and the weaker it's going to be attracting. So the ones with fewer energy levels are going to be more electronegative than the ones with higher energy levels. So what does this mean for a molecule? Well, if we look again at hydrogen chloride, hydrogen chloride, we can represent the bond between them as the orbitals touching, because all the bond is is two orbitals that are smushed into one. So we represent orbitals as these probability clouds, where this area here, this oval, shows the probability of the electron being there. And according to what I've just drawn, there should be an equal probability for the electron to be here than there is here. Or, sorry, the pair of electrons to be here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here, because this is an even radius. No, this is an even area, sorry. But in reality, because of the electronegativity of chlorine, the bonding pair is more likely 
to be around the chlorine than it is the hydrogen. So the the electrons have more of a chance to be here and here than there are here. And what does this mean for the overall molecule? Well, this area has more n or is more likely to have negative things in it. And this area is more likely to have positive things in it. So we can say that over time, the amount of electrons that are going to be around here is going to be more than here, meaning that this has a this side has a very slight minus charge, and this side of the bond has a very small positive charge, and we represent this small and positive charge with the letter delta. Now, if you do maths, you'll realize this as differentiation involved in differentiation, meaning a very small. So we say this has a delta minus charge, meaning it has a very small negative charge, and a delta plus, meaning this has a very small positive charge. So this isn't like ionic bonding, where we have a positive and a negative. We only have a very slight po negative and a very slight positive, because this isn't the electrons completely going over towards the chlorine. They're just more over the chlorine side than they are over the hydrogen side. So we call this type of bond a polar bond. So this bond is polar because it shows two poles, a positive pole and a negative pole. So the polarity of this bond is shown with this delta positive and this delta negative. So how do we measure electronegativity? Because all atoms are electronegative, but how do we compare them? Well, there are a lot of methods of doing it, and they're all different. Because electronegativity isn't a, a like scientific value that we can stick on something. It's not like speed, where we can measure the speed of something. It's not like volume, where we can measure the volume of something. Electronegativity is a factor of two things, and therefore we can't solidly measure it without supercomputers, probably. But there is a person who is called Linus Pauling, who in 1932 wrote a paper on a way to calculate electronegativity values. Now this guy won a Nobel Prize in chemistry and a Nobel Peace Prize for trying to stop nuclear weapons testing. So he's a very influential person, but his paper detailed a way to tell to work out these electronegativity values. And he used a method where he got three molecules. He had XX, he had YY, and he had XY. XY. So he these two letters represent two different elements. So this is two elements bonded together. This is two elements, two of the same element bonded together. And this is element X and element Y bonded together. And he said that if you can, that you can measure the bond strength in this molecule. So we can measure this bond strength. And we can measure this bond strength. And that will relate to this bond strength. But how does it relate? Well, if we think about it, we can say that if these electrons are shared equally, then the bond strength is probably going to be equal to the average bond strength seen among here. So we can say that the x, x, and the y, y, if we add them together and then divide it by 2 to get the average bond strength, that should be roughly equal to the xy bond strength if the electrons are shared evenly. But what he found was the mean bond strength was actually always smaller than the bond strength of the xy compound. Let's look at a real example that he used. He had hydrogen, a 
and he had chlorine and he had hydrogen chloride so HCl now the bond strength for hydrogen let's get a good color here is 436 kilojoules per mole that's just how we how we measure bond strength this is the energy within the bond the bond strength for chlorine was 243 kilojoules per mole and the energy for hydrogen chloride is 432 kilojoules per mole so we can work out the average bond strength here so we can work out 436 plus 243 divided by 2 and that equals 33 339 sorry 0.5 but we can see that the mean bond strength is lower than the actual bond strength than the bond strength for this hybrid molecule so why is that well he said that the extra strength that we find in this molecule must come from the electrostatic force of attraction between a positive and a very slightly negative part of this molecule. So what he meant by that was that in hydrogen chloride we have our delta positive, our delta negative, sorry, let me just rub that out, our delta negative value and our delta positive value alongside these atoms being attracted to the electrons in the bond this overall slightly positive atom was being attracted to the overall slightly negative atom and vice versa so this extra bond strength comes from these delta positive and these delta negative forces so he has discovered a way to measure the differences in electronegativity because the more something attracts these pair of electrons the more negative it's going to be and the bigger the difference between this mean bond strength and this actual bond strength of the hybrid molecule is going to be so he then worked out the most electronegative at um, the most electronegative element which is fluorine because it has the fewest um, it has the smallest uh, valence distance to uh, atomic number ratio so he knew that fluorine was the most negative element and he then set it on a scale so this is an arbitrary scale that he made and then he compared all of the other values that he got and stuck like rubidium down here um, nitrogen somewhere in the middle uh, he had oxygen slightly above that and uh, he had chlorine in between oxygen and nitrogen and then he assigned values to it so to avoid getting any negative numbers at the bottom here he assigned fluorine a value of 4.0 and rubidium 0.8 so be because rubidium is 0 0.8 compared to this fluorine with a value of 4. So then this scale shows the most electronegative atoms at the top and the least at the bottom. And this is one way of doing it, but there are many. For example, there was another guy called, um, his name was Mulliken, Mulliken, Mulliken. That's how I pronounce it anyway, I'm not sure on the actual pronunciation. But his electronegativity scale worked by working out the ionization energy, so the um, energy required to take away an electron to make a minus ion, no, to make a positive ion, sorry, and then the energy needed to add an electron to make it a negative ion, and then use these values to calculate electronegativity, and he ends up with a different scale. But the key thing about these different scales are that you can find trends that are the same on all of them. So let's say if we have a graph and this is 
Pauling scale. This is Pauling. This is Millikan's tail. If we plot where the elements are on each scale, this is the least and the most, we can find that there is an actual trend that develops between them. And we see this comparing all of the scales. So all of them might have different methods of detecting electronegativity, but we can say with certainty that all of them show the same trends. And that is a brief summary of electronegativity. The most important thing to remember about it though is the polar nature of the bonds. And we'll go more into detail about that and its implications in the next video, where I will talk about intermolecular bonding.